Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us tonight. We have uh, the great pleasure to have uh, one of the most prominent speakers in the world. I would ask uh, Professor Abzal Zaved to introduce to us uh, the famous Norma Santorius. We are grateful for him to be here with us and uh, share some of his wisdom with us. Abzal. Thank you very much and greetings from World Sakart Association. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and privilege that uh, under the leadership of Professor Fontulakis, we are continuing with these meet the expert and the exceptionally great people's contribution to the field of psychiatry. Today's speaker is not a, an individual. He is a legend. He is history and he is a role model for all of us and for the future psychiatrists. The work which he has done has inspired thousands of psychiatrists, trainees, students, and more importantly, policy makers. His contribution to psychiatry is enormous. While he was with WHO, leading the WHO division, he was instrumental in convincing the policymakers when he was president of World Psychiatric Association and European Psychiatric Association, he was actively involved in promoting psychiatry and mental health, not only among those who decide, but also among those who really practice and who get it implemented. Today's topic, which he is going to speak, is actually a word of wisdom. Over the years, he has conducted a number of leadership training courses. And when he is conducting these courses, he is always mindful that what a psychiatrist should look like, what a psychiatrist should do. And I think with this legacy, he has been able to tell all of us that how should we pose ourselves? What should be the future workforce? How should we not only look like, but also do the work? So Sir Professor Norman Sartorius, we are grateful to you for joining us. And we always look forward listening to you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Java. Thank you also very much, Professor Funtulankis, for including me in this uh, series, which I'm sure uh, will uh, be of interest to people because of the excellent group has already been uh, selected and who spoke uh, in it. Now, I would like to talk today about the future work workforce. And uh, uh, let me do this and just show a few slides with this. Um, at present, I think, and for a long time now, we have seen that the uh, uh, areas of interest for the mental health programs uh, in general uh, are those that are listed on this uh, uh, slide. We believe that the mental health services and psychiatrists should be concerned with the treatment of mental disorders. They should find ways of supporting and caring for people who experience mental illness, and not only by giving them treatment, but by also by advising them and making it possible, perhaps with the help of social workers or others, or the community at large, to make them live with their illness uh, and survive it. Um, I think that we have also uh, included into this uh, tasks a support of people who care uh, for those who are mentally unwell. And these are uh, very often or always carrying a major part of the uh, responsibility and a major part of work uh, to help the people who have been struck by mental illness. Uh, we have uh, also expected a normal mental health program 
would at, at, least, um, invest, at least invest some money, some time, and some personal involvement in business, uh, fighting against the stigma of mental illness. <clears throat> Equally so, uh, the, the other tasks of the mental health programs have been the secondary and tertiary prevention of mental disorders. Some primary prevention of mental disorders, I'll speak about this later. And of course, what has been called the promotion of mental health. Now, uh, today, uh, the uh, responsibility and the um, engagement of the mental health workforce is uh, as indicated on this slide. The number one priority that people see as their task is the treatment of mental disorders. Uh, a second of importance is some support to carers, some work against uh, uh, stigma, personal and social stigma, and some work on the secondary and tertiary prevention of mental disorders, that is reducing the number of people who will be disabled or helping those who are disabled to be accepted in society and find a job for them. The other uh, uh, three tasks, uh, I think, are uh, not so very much in the focus. It is somehow taken as a uh, normal that people uh, who are relatives or friends or uh, acquaintances of people with mental illness will be looking after themselves while at the same time helping people who have experienced a disorder. Primary prevention has been declared impossible and therefore is very little is done for it. And the promotion of mental health, not so much in the sense of reducing the number of people who are mentally ill, but in the sense of raising mental health on the scale of values that people have when they decide make decisions is also not particularly, uh, not given particularly much attention. So that is the current situation. And I think as we think about the century to come and the years to go, uh, we have to think whether this will really is satisfactory. My own opinion is it is not satisfactory. And we shall have to think about the future in a different set of priorities. Yes, we will have to continue worrying about the treatment of mental disorders and supporting people with mental illness. But the three major tasks that are before us is to thinking how to support people who provide care for those who are mentally ill, because they carry most of the burden. Many of the uh, carers will, in fact, today, even uh, find that by experience, they will know what medication to provide. And in a way, their role is in every day growing and becoming more important. I think that primary prevention and the promotion of mental health will be also becoming much more high on the list of priorities. And I will see that these three priorities will pop up much higher. And the things that we have until now considered as being the top priorities will gradually recede somewhat in the background. Now, what do we do at present for the carers, for people who look after the mental illness? We shouldn't forget that the ideas about the community uh, mental health, the modern ideas, have in fact been introduced in the middle of the 19th century. One of the great introducers was Professor Griesinger, who having come back from Egypt, where he has seen that families look so well after the mental ill, uh, felt that maybe uh, one should really change the nature of treatment and think of having a patient in the hospital or facility for a short while and then bringing him back into the community. And uh, that is uh, what has been considered as being a useful model of working with it. And so it is somehow been taken as normal, expected uh, that we shall, uh, uh, that these people in the community will be looking after people with mental illness, both those who are their relatives or friends and others who are members of the community. Uh, and this the support which has been given to them has been to the carers, usually, if at all, some financial support. Very often, uh, psychiatrists have given uh, some information and some advice, not particularly, uh, not spending too much time on it. They uh, give some lectures about how care should be done. Um, they also express their sympathy for the task which these people are doing, and uh, they recognize it, but they are not making a big spiel out of that. So um, this is what basically they get. And their friends and others who surround the carers, the person who provides care, 
uh, vary in the way in which they experience this. Some respect this and uh, acknowledge that they are doing an important things. Others withdraw from them because of the stigmatization, which very often spreads from the person who is ill to anyone who looks after him or cares for him, so that the whole family becomes isolated more and more. But here is the present support for carers. And this is a, if at all existing, a really miserable support. What we would need to think about adding uh, to people who are carers is at least to uh, assess the capacity of for care. At present, in the whole of Europe and in the whole of the other countries that I've been able to look at, there is not a single document that says what was, must be the minimum capacity of the family in order to be able to accept a person uh, with a mental illness for care. Imagine a, a small family which has a the husband and wife, the husband, shall we say, falls ill, the wife looks after three small children and after an elderly demented parent. Is she, is this family capable of accepting a person who has just suffered a very severe illness or who suffers still from a mental illness? And there are no criteria that we would say, this is a minimum that must be available in order to be able to entrust this family or these carers with a task to look after yet another person. We should uh, think also of direct help. Uh, we should think about uh, arrangements which will allow uh, people with, uh, who have a, uh, somebody in their care some free time. There were wonderful examples of the recommendations of the Danish uh, child psychiatrist for uh, uh, who has um, the lady, Annalise Dupont, whom I remember with much, uh, with much uh, respect. Uh, she has, in fact, suggested that perhaps mothers of mentally retarded children should create a group uh, so that um, any one of them will, in fact, be able to take a day off uh, while the others will look after their children. Uh, and in some places, the, so to say, care holidays have been introduced by which a person who is severely or long-term ill will be admitted to hospital, not because he is unwell, but because that would liberate the family to take a week or longer to be uh, to, to come back to their normal self, to recover a little bit from the enormous task which they have uh, been carrying so well and so silently. But there are other arrangements that can be done to help the carers live a life that is decent and a life that is not destroyed by the fact that he has or she has to look after another person who is severely ill. We should also give them recognition for uh, the effect that they have done such excellent work. Uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Britain has done the wonderful thing that they select a family every year to as being the family that has done most uh, admirably for there. But there are various other ways in which we could uh, uh, recognize that they are, uh, that carers are doing such a wonderful work. One of the things that would be extremely helpful is to allow and invite carers to come and teach at the medical school to medical students about care for people at home, because they know much better than any one of us how you have to look after a person who is not well when you're at home. Giving them an opportunity to teach would not only transmit useful knowledge to the, stu to the students, but would at the same time also mean that we are really recognizing that they know something which is valuable and that they are therefore all the more uh, useful members of society. We should also think of the fact that it is well documented that people who look after a sick uh, member of the family have about two times more uh, atten um, uh, attendances at general health care services. Their physical health suffers significantly from having a uh, person in care. So we should think of how to facilitate the treatment for these diseases which come along, making them less weight, for example, uh, uh, or do something else that uh, we could do to uh, make sure that they are looked after also for their physical health and uh, for their 
mental uh, satisfaction of being what they are. And we should listen to them when we are thinking about care and about organization of care. This is the minimum that we have to do for carers. And I think that we should also give them some money uh, because we are saving enormously by having them replace institutional care. So why not give them 10% of what we would have paid for a hospital care to look at uh, for their, after their patients at home? We should think also what we can invest as money into the organization of peer support organizations, which can provide some care to uh, people who are not related to them, but who are also uh, having a disease which, about which they know quite a bit and about which they can give good advice and also uh, some empathy and care. We should uh, also educate the carers about illness, both their own possible illnesses and illnesses that their, uh, the person in care has and facilitate the access to care for them, giving them a telephone number which they can call whenever it is necessary to proceed with care. 90% of people with severe mental illness will probably in the near future be looked after by one or two other people who are very often in a small nuclear family. We have to think of how to maintain that uh, uh, support and how to make sure that these people can do it properly. And then of course, we have to think about administrative arrangements and legal arrangements uh, for example, a reduction of the work time at work if they have a person or various other things that one could do. And one could learn from the carers of what they most need and we should listen to them. Now, the second neglected area that I mentioned earlier is the uh, primary prevention of mental disorders. And if you speak to people uh, in psychiatry in general, general opinion of psychiatrists as well as others is that mental health programs contain practically no, there is no chance to do any primary prevention and therefore they give no time to this particular task. Is this true? Well, maybe true at present, but we should understand that providing primary prevention program and intervention is of great importance. I'm listing here a few very simple ones that uh, would cost nothing and would at the same time be enormously helpful. Take, for example, the provision of iodine to pregnant women. Now, this is not done universally. And several every year, several million people are born with cretinism because their mothers did not have sufficient iodine during their pregnancy. It's a primary prevention of a severe mental disorder a severe burden for the community. We should think about screening for minor sensory deficits. Practically all of the countries in the uh, low income zone uh, will in fact have none or very few checks of whether the children who are in school or that age uh, of school uh, hear well and see well. Now a child that doesn't hear well will in general have more difficulties in school, he will be considered as stubborn and uh, misbehaving because he doesn't listen to when you speak to him and doesn't understand uh, what you're saying, even when he listens. And uh, very soon, such children will become dropouts from school. And very soon after they've been dropouts from school, they will be exposed to all the dangers that exist for a dropout uh, from school, from drugs and crime to uh, physical illness and problems uh, of a major kind. We should find people who have minor sensory deficit and do something for them. Uh, minor deficit in, for example, myopia is very often discovered because the children tell you they cannot read. But deficit of hypermetropia is not discovered. And a large number of children will in fact with hypermetropia be having difficulties reading and therefore will be sent in countries where such services exist to be treated for dyslexia, and basically they will also fail in school. And a simple test which would take both into account would be very important. Not to forget that in some countries, in fact, the discovery of a minor sensory deficit was on purpose disregarded. For example, minor myopia 
was disregarded and minor this hypermetropia because it was considered, as we know, that minor hypermetropia does correct itself somewhat uh, in uh, uh, the time of puberty of adolescence. But the lost years of not being able to read or follow school is not taken into account at that time. We should also think about known factors that are high risk uh, for mental illness, such as a, a mother's frequent uh, mother's mental illness or uh, uh, the frequent hospitalization of child and adds to the normal care an element that will make sure that they do not end up with a mental illness because of these risk factors of which we know very well. And of course, the uh, major problem that is of economic nature is that hundreds of millions of children in the low income countries are in fact stunted. They have not developed as fast and as much as they could have developed had they been given appropriate stimulation and appropriate food and appropriate care. And we should recognize that the fact that they don't eat as they should be eating and don't look and are not stimulated and uh, cared for as much, that in fact, this creates a huge increase in the risk for a mental disorder, alcohol and drug abuse, and a variety of other problems. So there are undoubtedly possibilities uh, for primary prevention of mental disorders, and it should become one of our priorities. There are other examples as well that I could list. For example, we could uh, uh, think of active and permanent effort to participate in perinatal care. Now, there are very few countries in which the normal perinatal care programs include elements of uh, mental health, not only to discover depression, which may occur in the last months of the pregnancy, but also thinking of other high risk events that happen and also of the extraordinary opportunity to help mothers and fathers while they're expecting a baby to, uh, to tell them and teach them about ways of bringing up children, about parenting, about risks, and a variety of things like that. And parenting education in itself is a hugely neglected thing. Practically nobody is in fact organizing appropriate parenting education. And we are somehow having this crazy idea that people are born with a capacity to be fathers and mothers. Well, they are not. And they make a huge number of mistakes which could be avoided quite easily if we did some parenting education in a regular way. Uh, there is very little uh, effort also to link psychiatric services with school programs and in programming education and ways in which education is done. All of these are opportunities for primary prevention, which are currently not being used. Now, the third neglected area, which I think it should be, uh, which should be really given appropriate attention is the promotion of mental health. Now, as you know, promotion of mental health can, be, can mean three things. It can mean, number one, the reduction of mental illness. The number of mentally ill people in a particular community is reduced, and we say the mental health in this community has been promoted. All right. The second one is we can think that the promotion of mental health is if we increase the uh, higher resilience of people, uh, make them acquire, uh, achieve, a variety of things, uh, learn and develop, and so forth. The third way of uh, uh, thinking about the promotion of mental health is in fact different, it's basically different. And that is that the promotion of mental health is a process by which we are bringing mental health higher on the scale of priorities of individuals and societies. That they think about mental health as being a precious thing for which it is worth making sacrifices because mental health is so important for life of quality. And that is something that we are currently not doing. So that mental health is ill-defined, not particularly looked after, and certainly not sufficiently, uh, there's insufficient effort to promote the value that people give to mental health. 
So I think that all three of these aspects are important and should be given incomparably more attention. Now, how do we prepare ourselves for these tasks that I here mentioned, or some of them that I mentioned? Number one, I think we should significantly invest into the revision of the way in which future doctors are selected. It is not the one who has the best marks in secondary school who is likely to be a good doctor. We have to, we know many of the personality characteristics. However, there are very few countries which really pay sufficient attention to advise a young uh, persons who want to enter into a, a particular postgraduate education or graduate education, what would be the best thing for them to do? We should think much more about what is it that we really want to find in future doctors and select youngsters in so far as possible for who will be likely to achieve these goals. We will make mistakes, that's for sure. But for many, in many instances, we will not make the mistakes and we should recognize the empathy, the capacity for empathy or the interest in human things or the capacity to make the way in which a people are built, which makes them better candidates for good doctors. We should certainly revise the undergraduate and postgraduate education and say a word about this uh, in a moment. We should uh, examine the laws which are regulating healthcare and make sure that every one of the laws that we have about health and mental health has a sunset clause. There are still countries which are having laws which are obsolete, uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years old, and they have not been revised at all. In the future, every law that we produce should say, here is a law which we are putting forward. It's based on today's knowledge and today's society. In three years time, we have to go back to that law and see whether it's still appropriate for the society at that point in time, at that point of development of science, at that point of the legal situation as it has changed. And the sunset clauses in all of our legislation would have to be introduced. Not to mention that, of course, since we didn't get, did do that in the past, we should probably think of revising or at least reviewing the mental health legislation as it currently exists. <laughs> we should think about introducing much more about health into the general education, not the old traditional style only wash your hands before you eat, but really think a little bit more about ways of promoting health and give it a decent place in the general education so as to increase the self-help capacity of people, so as to increase the capacity to help others, so as to increase the capacity to accept people who have disabilities and so forth. And this particular thing, a very large proportion of people are imperfect. Uh, and thinking of accepting those who are particularly imperfect is very important and has to be done. And I hope that we can think that uh, uh, we shall introduce an appropriate uh, component, an appropriate time and effort into making people ready and willing to accept people who are imperfect and help them to survive and live a better life. Now, we will also have to think about uh, uh, the personality of the future doctors and future, uh, and the personality in which what we are going to search for is the capacity of for empathy, a sense of justice, things of this kind, and acceptance of cultural differences. All of these things are very difficult to add to persons who don't have them. So we would do much better for ourselves and for the medical profession and for the psychiatric profession if we selected people who already have these uh, characteristics. It will not be easy to attract them to come to psychiatry. And we'll have to make an effort to change a little bit the image of psychiatry and also to make sure that we pay sufficient attention and respect to these uh, new things that we are uh, thinking. And therefore, we also have to make the workplace for people who work in psychiatry much more attractive. And the challenge is in front of the government because the fact that we do not have a standardized cadre, good people who will in fact help uh, to promote mental health in its three senses will uh, 
produce a huge burden on society, and society has every interest in the world to do something about this. Now, psychiatrists in the future, well, in addition to what I said earlier, I think that we have to think that psychiatrists of the future will also have to have something else. Number one, they should be expert users and teachers of communication skills. You look sometimes at psychiatrists today, they are invited to come and speak on television. Are they competent speakers? Do they in fact convince the audience? Perfect, very good speaking can be learned. It's one of the communication skills. And doctors should in fact be given, particularly psychiatrists, should be given a variety of communication skills. They should learn how to negotiate. They should learn how to convince. When we speak, speak about uh, making sure that women are receiving iodine at the, uh, uh, during their pregnancy, it is not the psychiatrist who will go and give the iodine. It is the psychiatrist, however, who should convince the government to do it. And in order to do the convincing, he has to know how to do this. We should start thinking and do much more to find ways to deal with comorbid uh, mental and physical disorders. We see a huge increase of comorbidity of mental and physical disorders. And at the same time, in parallel, a fragmentation of medicine into ever smaller disciplines, which so that nobody deals with a, all of the diseases anymore. It's psychiatry deals with the depression and diabetology deals with the diabetes. And uh, there are three other doctors who deal each with a little piece. And I think we have to think of organizing the care in a manner that will ensure that we simultaneously approach the variety of comorbid diseases that are present. People die because of comorbid diseases much sooner than they would otherwise. People with mental illness die 15 years earlier than people who do not have mental illness, not because they have a mental illness, but because they have a mental illness and the physical illness and the comorbidity is managed so miserably. Of course, the psychiatrists have to remain competent in their own field, know about psychiatry and its treatment. And they should start also thinking of being not only doctors in treating the illness, but also advisors about ways of creating a life after an illness, which very often lasts a long time and certainly uh, influences a person's life so much. They will also have to accept and be willing to work and listen to people who have experienced mental illness, to people who have uh, uh, been looking after persons who have mental illness. And I think that listening and being able to accept that we psychiatrists are not perfect, nor do we know everything that we need to do a good service is of tremendous importance. And as I said earlier, and I repeated, having empathy, not only for those who are mentally ill, but also for their family, for colleagues who work with you, and for the miserable suffering in the general uh, uh, thing is an important feature of a good doctor and a particularly important feature for a good psychiatrist. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that the world of tomorrow will bring many of the changes and most of those changes we can predict and we know exactly what will happen. And I think we have to think of ways in which the focus will have to be changed of all medical uh, establishments and uh, doctors, including psychiatry, while at the same time remembering that no matter what changes we are doing, we will need to put enormous empathy, importance on empathy and uh, uh, technical competence going with it. I think that uh, we can ease and make the future much better by employing a variety of effective measures now. We will experience the benefit of some of them, but our, those who come after us will be very grateful to what we have done. Because otherwise, if we don't do it, society will not be a nice place to live. And being ill will be a much greater problem than it ever was in the past. So I thank you very much for your attention and for thanking you all. And thank you also for inviting me to participate in this series. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sartorius, for these words of wisdom. And I think uh, uh, the conclusion which you have really given, that is the way forward and that is the future. 
we have got some uh, questions. Uh, so should I just uh, uh, ask Professor Fontulekas to ask, uh, to take any questions for you? I think that uh, Norman gave us, uh, uh, with his large experience uh, from international, from the international environment, gave us uh, a very good idea uh, on uh, what it will be expected by a mental health professional in the in the near future. Uh, my main concern, and I would like to have your opinion on that. My main concern is that, especially with the pandemic we witnessed something that we were, uh, we were suspecting, but uh, we haven't seen uh, in, in such a magnitude and strength. And th that is the, the denial, the denial of existence of, uh, of a pandemic, which is there with people dying. And still a lot of our, uh, a lot of people denied the existence of uh, something which was so obvious which means that we will have probably uh, much difficulty to persuade concerning mental health, mental illness, uh, treatment for, for them, uh, which is much more elusive in comparison to, to a pandemic. Uh, and we were also uh, witnessed the mechanisms and the needs behind such a denial uh, and such an alternative, let's say, uh, experience of reality. Do you have any uh, comment on that? Any 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 ideas? I mean that the the resistance, <laughs> the resistance to mental health is is great and beyond logic. Well, the pandemic, uh, I think, uh, had a number of uh, expected consequences and some unexpected. Uh, for example, an unexpected consequence was the reduction of uh, child mortality during the pandemic. There was a unexpected consequence was uh, also that the suicide rates varied. In some countries they went up, in other countries they went down. Um, uh, all of these are, but a very important, unexpected, but very important event that happened was that governments as such, no country in the world, they acted as they should act. And there was a number of things that could have been done had we been prepared to, uh, do something about the pandemic. We have now learned what are the elements of a government response to a major threat such as a pandemic. And I hope that that will help us dealing with the pandemic. Now, the pandemic, however, had also other consequences. Uh, it increased the, what is called delayed morbidity. It's all the people who have not got vaccination, not for uh, COVID, but vaccination for other child childhood diseases, which has been postponed or canceled, uh, all of the people who for three years long have not been discovered for their uh, uh, cancer of the breast or uh, prostate cancer or other cancers because these services of screening have not been in place. These people will be uh, a burden that we will have to carry as time goes by. Now, thinking about mental health, however, one thing that we have seen is that the uh, everybody, there was a report that the number of people with depression and anxiety have grown. But I think it was an important message in that because it is not that the number of people with depression has grown as much. There was a number, there is an increase of the number of people who were depressed, but they were depressed for real reasons, not because they had a disease depression. They were depressed because they lost their job, they lost their time, they lost everything. And maybe they lost a relative and died, who died in it. So that one important thing that we shall have to distinguish is what are the uh, relevant changes of mental health that we as psychiatrists have to deal with and what are the consequences of events uh, that can be only controlled by the government and by uh, the society as a whole. I think that these are two different tasks. We cannot treat uh, a depression which is due to uh, the fact that one has been thrown out from his work. This is a thing that depends on the, on the employer, not on, 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 the, on, on a psychiatrist. So that's another consequence that we have to think about. Uh, now, maybe some other things that are important as well. I think that we shall, that perhaps we have learned 
uh, also uh, of uh, the necessity to increase the power of the health authorities, which are present not had much power at all. They were saying things and thinking about things, but they have not really had the possibility to introduce resolute measures uh, when they were necessary. Another task that I think we see before us is the, is the question of the behavior of the health personnel. The fact that 30% of all health personnel in some countries refuse to have vaccination uh, is something that we should think about. I mean, this is a measure that uh, would suffer for somebody, not only that the person's health will suffer, but these are people who also transmit disease as well. So why is this happening? Have we selected these people correctly? Have we, treated, uh, have we done sufficient to, to educate them as time goes by? So there's a variety of changes, I think, that are important for medicine as a whole and for psychiatry, which will be a consequence. One other thing which is important and should be done now, we have seen that the stigma of mental illness has been particularly uh, ugly during the time of the pandemic that mental health departments have been emptied so as to create place for people with COVID. And the patients who were having mental illness were let to go out into the street uh, and not given any treatment anymore. Uh, and there was a variety of other things. And the consequence was, of course, that there was the mortality of people with mental illness has sharply increased during the time of the pandemic, because on one hand, they were not given care that they should be. And the other, they were also exposed to very severe stigma. So it's a complicated business, and maybe at some stage I'd be, uh, I should, we'll have a chance to talk about uh, the positive and negative sides of the pandemic and the ways in which we can deal with the future. These are just some uh, I was, thoughts. I, I was mainly uh, asking concerning a very specific thing that a lot of people denied the pandemic. And this has similarities with denying mental illness. And in general, they, they had an attitude and a behavior which was uncooperative uh, towards uh, measures and treatments. So I am, now let's forget the pandemic. If this is a, a generalized tendency of the public, uh, my question is, uh, uh, are we going to face this in the future not in the frame of a pandemic, but in our everyday uh, uh, clinical practice concerning the treatment of mental patients. I mean, this, this resistance to mental illness. Well, I think that the, the education, uh, or rather the, the creating of an attitude, creating of a character, creating of a person is happening in early years. And we should have to think of investing incomparably more in educating parents about the way in which they should educate their children to make them capable of accepting, to make them capable of dealing with people who are not well. A variety of other things that we would like to see in adults. We are not seeing it in adults because the education at home has been continuously deteriorating over the time that we have before us. Take the imp impact of the uh, women going out of the house for work more often than before. The fact that that has happened meant that the women have been given an extra load because they were supposed to do the things that they did yesterday. And at the same time, they had also their job on their shoulders. And the structures of the families have suffered from it. And the education of the children is no longer uh, um, um, given the attention that it should be given. Uh, the schools cannot educate children alone. They can provide knowledge and some education but the education which Aristoteles and others have been thinking is important of making people good members of society depends on a, not only on the school, but on all of those who surround the child. And that is the family, which has to have time and wish to do something about it, which is the society with laws that are appropriate, which is also, of course, the schools. And I think creating people who will be willing to accept and to work uh, is something that is a big task for the future. Uh, sir, I have got, uh, I received one or two questions. Uh, uh, one of the question is uh, very important that uh, uh, you spoke about capacity building, you spoke about how to sensitize our future workforce 
towards the understanding of patient as well as carer's needs. So in addition to this theoretical work, would you recommend with all your experience going globally that what sort of practical aspects should be included in the training? Yes, it, it, it would be very easy to recommend it. The more difficult task would be to find somebody who would listen because so many of our colleagues, in fact, are convinced that what they are doing is perfect. I mean, there are so many simple things that we could, uh, that one could do. Uh, I mentioned one example of that is uh, to sensitize a student of medicine uh, into the, uh, about the specifics of his work, one has to think a little bit more and not just of lectures on endocrinology. Uh, a colleague of ours, Dr. Herzlich, many years ago, she required that any uh, person who is going into medical school in the second year spends at least 24 hours in a house with somebody who, uh, in a house in which there is a very severely ill person, just to know what it means to have a severely ill person at home. And that formed the students. They thought about it much later. It was a very simple act. And uh, it was something that was important. And there are numerous similar things that we could introduce into the training of medical doctors uh, to make them doctors and not just people who have learned uh, the books on medicine. Because being a doctor does mean uh, much more than just really treating a disease. And I think that that is something that unfortunately in medical schools today is to a large extent still neglected. They, they learn the technology, but they don't learn the, the skills and the, the human side of medicine. You are absolutely right that uh, in our medical curriculum, especially at our undergraduate level, we when we talk about mental health, we generally means a mental disorder. That's right. Whereas we are missing the gap between mental health and mental disorder, and that is the mental well-being. Well, the general practice would benefit so much from, from having doctors who have understood a little bit more about mental health and mental illness. Uh, we had done a sur once a little study, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, we have asked the general practitioners uh, to uh, not say anything for two minutes but just to nod and accept what the patient was saying. Uh, that was the instruction which we gave them. And then as they came, the patients came out, we asked them, how was it? Uh, how was your interview? Today? How was the visit? And they said, well, I've never got so much good advice as this. This is a different, different doctor. And in fact, if you look at today, the average time in which that a doctor spends before he interrupts the patients when the patients come through the door is 25 seconds. Uh, as the patient comes through the door, uh, he says, so please, what brings you here? Patient starts speaking, says, I have a headache. And says, yes, when is it a headache? Morning or afternoon? Uh, patients are never allowed to have a few minutes and the doctors have not learned the most essential skill, which is important for all medical professionals, which is the skill of listening. And I could go on listing skills of that type, which would have to be introduced. And they're not expensive to introduce, introduce into medical training uh, to make doctors who are different in their nature. And the point being of all of this, that the doctor who knows how to listen will in fact, in the long run, spend much less time with the patient than the one who doesn't. Because it's a different relationship that establishes itself. And one, by learning how to listen, you are in fact much like more likely to take the right road to, uh, to help the patient. We have got sir, another question. Uh, and if I understand correctly, the question is that it looks like the exposure of certain information matters in terms of promoting weather, including promoting mental health. But at the same time, exposure can also be detrimental. So, Will this make sense to increase the exposure of information to promote mental health and avoid any further stigmatization or complication? Well, I think that we have just published a book on um, reviewing 
what is the novelty about fighting stigma. And uh, I think that stigma of mental illness is uh, undoubtedly the number one problem that we have today in dealing with psychiatry. And I think that we have to think of fighting stigma as an essential time, an essential part of health services, which have to invest massively into uh, thinking about what can be done about stigma. We know today that the most important uh, method of reducing stigma is social contact of different types. And we have seen huge advances in uh, promoting and facilitating social contact with people who experience mental illness and the effect that that had on those who surround them. But we have today a number of uh, uh, techniques which deal with stigma in a competent manner. And it is a great pity that these techniques and ways of doing it are not given much attention, no time and no money. And I think that is something that is very sad and probably makes our services much less effective and makes our profession much more attractive. And we are therefore not getting the, uh, uh, the sufficient candidates who would like to learn all that we need to, to tell them. Uh, well, if Professor Fontelakis allow me, because there are so many questions and comments that we can have, but because of the limited time, uh, I have got just one question which I would really like to ask seen from the comments from our participants. You have done a number of uh, leadership training courses. What do you think? How was that taken by the participants of these courses, the young psychiatrists, the young professionals? <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 this is not, I shouldn't do this, but it's a time to be immodest because uh, there was in fact uh, I think there is unanimity. The people who went in those courses uh, have uh, spoken about them with very uh, with much uh, uh, respect and uh, they in, had a very good time there. And I think that there are some elements of these courses which uh, were uh, contributing to this. One of the elements was that uh, I think that we are treating people when they come to these courses, we are listening to what they have to say and we are trying to build their capacity to become more prominent. And we are trying to be individual about learning skills. Different people can do, can use different skills with diff differently. Some people are very good listeners. Others are very good talkers. Others are very good smilers. There are recognizing uh, what is the, your power and your strengths is very important. And many of the uh, uh, participants in the courses came away knowing more about themselves. And because of that, uh, much more, uh, they found it more easy to work and to continue their, their jobs. Uh, some of them speak about life-changing experience, but that's uh, maybe just a, a flattering way. But all of them have been recommending this course to others. And I think that we have a, uh, usually a very large number of uh, candidates for every single spot, which to me is a, uh, a very good measure of how popular these courses are. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sartorius. Uh, Professor Fontelakis, any concluding remarks? Because uh, you are the initiator of this great Meet the Expert series. Well, there is not anything to say after, <laughs> after a speech like that. Uh, uh, it was both a pleasure and an honor to have you here, Norman. Thank you very much for uh, your contribution to our efforts to educate uh, colleagues around the world with th this new way of teaching and communicating, which is the Zoom, the, the online platforms, which are maybe too technical, especially for us psychiatrists and psychologists that are too technical, but still it's a powerful uh, tool to bring uh, people like you from the comfort of your house or uh, uh, office uh, to uh, to an audience around the world. So thank you very much for your uh, very valuable contribution. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you and, and, and thank you for and thank you for uh, uh, writing the prologue to my book. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a wonderful book, I want to say, and I, I would like to use the opportunity to promote it. 
I think it's a... You haven't read it. That's why you are saying it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Javed, for your kind words and for introducing me with so much, uh, uh, with so much kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Take care. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Until next time, have a nice evening. Bye-bye.